the idea of a united germany gradually took shape in the various german states and particularly in prussia in the first half of the 19th century we saw that on the whole the german states pursued a conservative policy but at the same time a broader liberal movement gradually emerged particularly in prussia and in the southern german states and particularly more particularly in the rhineland area of prussia the liberals looked for a constitution a representative assembly and certain basic civic rights for the individuals a climactic point came in 1848 when there was a frankfurt parliament where the liberals discussed threadbare the possibilities of german unity along the liberal line but ultimately failed to adopt a practical agenda or program for achieving the unity along liberal lines the failure of 1848 was not final germany was indeed united within the next 22 years but it was not along the liberal lines the leadership for the movement of german unity was now assumed by the state of prussia and it is prussia which succeeded in establishing the german reich in 1871 the prussian king became the german emperor the prussian chancellor became the imperial chancellor now what one did one does not always notice is the gradual rise of prussia as the most important german state in terms of its gradual but sure economic development in the realm of ideas and in the realm of uh, leadership now prussia's real emergence in economic terms can be traced back to the formation of the solferein in 1833 this economic union or customs union ultimately provided for the unity of a market among a large number of german states and very clearly indicated the leading role that prussia was likely to take in uh, this uh, sphere by 1850 germany had about 6000 km of railways germany had taken some leadership in producing coal and lignite and indeed by the 1860s germany had overtaken france in this regard iron production also became very important uh, particularly between 1860 and 1870 the expansion of the railroad and the heavy industries in prussia was carried out by private capital whereas those in most other german states uh, was a product of a uh, state initiative the state taking the lead in providing industrialization prussia also fully appreciated the military use of this uh, industrial uh, growth or industrial expansion the manufacture of heavy artillery for example tended to transform field warfare the reforms in the financial sector in particular made prussia the leader in this sector as well prussia now had enough access to uh, capital which could be invested in both industrial production and in business now i'm not suggesting that prussia had become industrialized already but a very definite beginning had been made uh, by the 1840s and more specifically by the 1850s the prussian bank which was established in 1847 was ultimately to become the imperial bank in 
1971. About 50 banks emerged by that time and of these 33 had uh, been created or set up in the 1850s. So the banks succeeded in mobilizing the savings and transform them into capital which could now be invested in economic enterprises, industry, business and other productive activities. The growth of population, their movement into the towns um, and the decline of the rural industries also uh, had been a very significant phenomena. It provided for the creation of mobile labor. People were moving out of the countryside because agriculture could not sustain everyone equally. And therefore, this mobile labor provided what could be absorbed in the newfangled industries which were coming up in the urban areas. Otto von Mantufel, who was a Minister of the Interior from 1848 to 1850 and Minister President and Foreign Minister from 1850 to 58, indeed introduced many very serious economic reforms. Indeed, after 1848, the Prussian ministers, particularly Mantufel, paid more serious attention to economic reforms, economic reorganization and economic development than looking at the political aspects of Prussian development. There was also change in the rural sphere. Many of the small tenants had been freed of their old feudal obligations and about 600,000 peasants took advantage of this to buy their freedom from these obligations by making a one-time payment. The government even provided loans so that the peasants could redeem uh, their obligations in this. Prussian agriculture had two very broad differences. On the one hand was the vast Junker estates east of the river Elbe. And this is a, a difference that stayed in Germany even after the unification and it is important to remember this. These vast Junker estates were run by the old feudal landowning aristocracy but they worked it with landless labor and, and virtually used them as wage labor. In the western part of Prussia there was a small tenant economy which uh, had not been uh, very, very conducive for everyone. The pressure of population made many of them migrate to the towns and uh, this is how the growth in the urban centers, growth of industries could absorb this excess population moving on to the towns. Therefore, Prussia was very equipped now after Solferein to assume the economic leadership in Germany as well and this would later be transformed into a more effective and serious political leadership. As Frederick B. Motz, who was one of the founders of the Solferein, had said that, you know, this sense of cohesiveness in terms of customs and economy would always induce a desire to be part of a common political system as well. And this is a point we had made even earlier that this sense of economic unity worked slowly and unobtrusively for a larger political and administrative unity. Prussia's privileged position was not endangered because Prussia was very jealous of it and every attempt of Austria to join the Solferein had been rebuffed very seriously. But what one sees also is that the, there was growing intellectual support for Prussia's quest for uh, assuming leadership and it had come from historians like Trishke, Seibel and Droysen. The old king Frederick William IV was mentally a little unsound and in 1857 his brother William became the regent and in 1860, William emerged as the king of Prussia. 
he had a passion to unite Germany. Obviously, he had his own methods by which to achieve this and to begin with, he had the support of even the liberals and the nationalists. The Crimean War provided the backdrop for the demand of army reform or military reforms in Germany. Prussia and Austria seem to have two different takes. Austria proposed a united, uh, unified command for the whole of the confederation. Whereas Prussia suggested that there should be two divisions under Prussian command in the northern part of the confederation and two divisions under Austrian command in the southern part of the confederation. So the significance of this difference of opinion was not really military, it was political. It centered around the relative position of Austria and Prussia in Germany and we shall see that the decade of the 60s gradually unfolded the drama and finally decided in favor of Prussia. It is at this juncture that we find Otto von Bismarck coming back to the political fold again. He put the famous Baden Memorandum on the defense and organization of Germany. He argued that the Crimean War and the collapse of the Holy Alliance had altered the balance of power in Europe, particularly in Central Europe. Prussia now had a central responsibility for the defense of Germany. And this responsibility could be discharged through the creation of a new body representative of the whole of uh, Germany in which Prussia rather than Austria should <coughs> dominate. Bismarck was born in an old Junker family in Brandenburg and in 1847-48 in the Frankfurt Parliament had clearly established himself as a leader of the conservative party. He did not believe in liberalism whom he often dismissed as chatterboxes. Bismarck wanted Prussia to be, uh, Germany to be unified but surely under Prussian uh, leadership. Even before Bismarck had come, there had been attempts at beginning an army reform in Prussia and in this, when the king wanted to have additional grants and summon the assembly, the assembly refused to do this unless further liberal reforms had been uh, offered by the king. Von Roon and von Moltke, they set about the task of uh, reorganizing the army, but the opposition of the assembly was a problem. Bismarck came in in 1860 and Bismarck collected the taxes anyway and the army reform was underway and Prussian army was reformed to a very large extent. Now, the ignoring of the assembly came very naturally to Bismarck. He had very little use for constitutional finesse and for elected assemblies. It is at this point that Bismarck took over. Conventional wisdom would credit Bismarck with a very precisely planned and executed program for the unification of Germany under Prussian leadership. First of all, he gave a speech to the assembly in which he said that the great issues of the day will be decided not by speeches and resolutions, but by a policy of blood and iron. He suggested that the army was very necessary and uh, power politics is necessary to achieve the unification. It has also been suggested because of a chance remark that he made and reported by Disraeli, the future British Prime Minister, that he would have to wage three wars by which to unify Germany under Prussia's leadership. Now this view does not take into consideration the role of the contingent on the one hand and the famous quip by the celebrated British economist James Keynes in 1919 that German unity was as much the result of coal and iron as of blood and iron. 
Now we had we had already suggested how coal and iron had preeminently uh, prepared Germany for the eventual uh, leadership that could be offered. But for the present, Bismarck certainly uh, uh, privileged the position of the army and uh, underlined the need to use power politics and, and even wars in order to unify them. Having done this, having achieved the uniform uh, uh, reform of the army and having collected the taxes to make this possible, Bismarck had his battle with the, uh, with the liberals. But he now decided to test his army and the first war came with Denmark in 1863. It was over the question of Schleswig-Holstein, which had generated tremendous heat in 1848. Now, it was solved by the Treaty of London in 1852, which said that the king, would, king of Denmark would preserve, keep the duchies, but Schleswig would also continue to be part of the German Bund. Palmerston, when asked about this solution, said that only three people knew this. The Prussian king is mad, the prince consort is dead, and I have quite forgotten it. Nevertheless, Bismarck had no use for the early agreements. The occasion arose when the king of Denmark died in 1853. He was followed by Christian of Glücksburg. Christian of Glücksburg now virtually wanted the incorporation of Schleswig into Denmark. There was another claimant of the throne, Frederick of Augustenburg. He wanted to go to war with Denmark on behalf of the Bund. Bismarck perceived this opportunity, but he wanted to make this war together with Austria. So Prussia and Austria moved against Denmark. Denmark was easily overwhelmed. And after that, by the convention of Gastein, Austria and Bismarck decided that Schleswig will be administered by Prussia, Holstein would be administered by Austria and therefore the first test of Bismarck's new army was made and Denmark was overwhelmed. The European powers were propitiated. Uh, it was seen that uh, Russia would not uh, go into war on, on any issue because Bismarck had supported Russia during the Polish revolt a little earlier. The second war that Bismarck waged was with Austria. Now, this was a war for which he very carefully prepared and he picked up a quarrel over a proposal that there should be a new uh, bond, there should be a new constitution and uh, Austria should ultimately be eased out of the German Confederation. Bismarck knew that Britain would probably continue with his neutrality the neutrality of the Russian Tsar was assured. Italy's neutrality was bought with the promise that if Austria was defeated, Venetia would be given to Italy to complete her unity. Bismarck even met the French Emperor Napoleon III at Biarritz and made him the same promise that if he remained neutral, Venetia would be given to him for eventual handover to Italy. Indeed, a little later, uh, Napoleon even uh, met Austria and struck this bargain that whatever the outcome of the war, Venetia must go to Italy. There was obviously a great disagreement by Austria about the Prussian proposal of a new constitution and reorganization of the Bund. Some German states supported Austria. The war ultimately came in June 1866, the Seven Weeks War, and Austria was routed in the Battle of Sadowa or as it is known now, Konigratz. This resulted in the final exclusion of Austria from Germany. Bismarck, having defeated Austria, did not wish to impose very harsh terms on her. What transpired was that a North German confederation was now created with the Prussian king as its president and the Prussian chancellor, Bismarck as its chancellor. It would be the confession of the north of the river Main. The association of southern German states, Bavaria, Baden and Uttermark had been allowed. Austria would be outside the Bund. There would be two assemblies, the Bundestag or the Federal Council, 
representative of states, the lower house of the Reichstag would be directly elected on the basis of universal suffrage. This was a concession to the liberals. Bismarck, what is very significant to note, on the support of the liberals up to a point now. On September 3, 1866, the Prussian parliament, by a majority of 230 votes to 75, gave endorsement or sanction to the loans that Bismarck had collected earlier by force and illegally. This meant that the liberals had accepted the larger unity Bismarck had achieved, even though it had not been among, along liberal lines. As AJP Taylor had commented, the struggle between the crown and parliament reached its term, but in Prussia, it is the crown which had won. But nevertheless, what a sense does one make of this? There was probably some kind of a compromise, probably an unequal compromise. Bismarck did not have much uh, love for the liberals, as we had noted earlier. But let us note that when Bismarck achieved the North German Confederation and succeeded in excluding Austria, he had won the support of the older historians like the liberal historians like Trashke, Sibel and Theodor Mommsen, who all endorsed this. He had uh, support of Franz Waldeck, a radical member of the Prussian Assembly in this. But what is more interesting is the comment of a liberal lawyer, Rudolf Ehring. A little before the war, he wrote, perhaps no war had been broached with such shamelessness, such horrible frivolity, as has the war which Bismarck is trying to raise against Austria. One's innermost feelings are revolted by such an outrage against every principle of law and morality. Just after the war, three months later, he says, I bow before the genius of Bismarck who has performed a masterpiece of political combination and ability. For one such man of action, I would give a hundred men of liberal persuasion. Now, Bismarck achieved the unity. Prussia's domination was achieved over the rest of Germany. Austria was excluded. But the liberals also received acceptance of free trade and universal suffrage. So, it was a compromise an unequal compromise in favor of the Prussian state. The third and last stage came through the war with France. Bismarck was uh, waiting for an opportunity with Napoleon III as the emperor of France. He did not have to wait for long. There was a, a very soon an occasion over the question of succession to Spanish throne. Uh, Leopold, the Hohenzollern prince, was a candidate. France demanded that this candidature be withdrawn. Prussia agreed, the candidature was withdrawn. Then Napoleon sent Benedetti, who uh, was the French ambassador, who met the king at a place called Ems and demanded that the candidature should not be with, uh, repeated in future. The king said he considered the matter to be closed and would do nothing more. He then sent the information in a telegram to Bismarck, who leaked the an edited version of the telegram and it suggested that France uh, had been insulted. There was war hysteria in France and ultimately Napoleon was goaded into declaring war with Prussia. The war came quickly and France was routed in the Battle of Sedan. The Prussian army entered France and indeed Paris and on uh, in January 1871 in the famous Hall of Mirrors of the Palace of Versailles, the German Reich was created. William became the first German Emperor of the Reich and Bismarck became the Chancellor. Virtually the old constitution of the North German Confederation had been recreated. Thus, Germany was finally united under Prussia's leadership with Prussia virtually assuming the new uh, German em Empire uh, dominating the new German Reich and it was achieved through the three wars. Now, it was a curious blend of authoritarianism and liberalism. There was universal suffrage, there was elected assembly, but no parliamentary responsibility. Purse strings 
remained with the king. The chancellor would be responsible to the emperor and not to the Reichstag or the lower assembly. As Uhland had said that the liberals expected the new king to be anointed with a drop of democratic oil. And Eric Eichen, an oh, very, very eminent historian of the earlier days of uh, uh, Germany, said that it was an extraordinary and fateful accomplishment of Bismarck that this democratic oil was entirely avoided. Thus the unification was achieved. Another question that has often been raised whether it was an extension of Prussia rather than a simply a unification of Germany and fulfillment of German nationalism. As Schulz said that you know it's true that it was ultimately achieved from above and not through by the state and not through popular initiative from below. But it is necessary to relativize this position. You see many liberal idioms were adopted and at least the liberals and the nationalists succeeded if not imposing their means on Bismarck at least their goals and as we had noted earlier there was a degree of compromise. We, we had noted in this lecture or the last two lectures how the German desire for unity emerged in the course of the first half of the 19th century how the various alternatives had been thrown up, how they were tried and how finally the Prussian way with the emergence of Prussia as the strongest economic power in, and again the military power in Germany made it possible for Bismarck to assume the leadership of Prussia and thus unify Germany through the means of power politics.